one of the issues that a lot of writers have is ignorance <laughs> of specific details. Most of these are originals, but some re some are reproductions because I can't afford the originals, um, and some are just the originals are just a little bit too um, too frail. Another thing is I'm barely touching the surface. There's a lot of, of uh, rabbit holes that I'm just like, ah, God, I can't go down that one. Um, just because it will lead me off into a four or five hour lecture and nobody's got the stamina for that. So we're gonna start off, although officially we're calling it 1815, um, the end of the, uh, the, the War of 1812, um, but Trans-Mississippi, because that's what we're really talking about when we're saying Wild West, the Trans-Mississippi West. Uh, we actually went to Williamsburg in 1999. It was kind of cool. They had these posters. Williamsburg, Wild West, 1699. Because it was. In 1699, Williamsburg, Virginia was the Wild West. Our concept of the Wild West is a little further west, so we're going to talk Trans-Mississippi. So the first serious American incursions into the Wild West with the Louisiana Purchase of 1803 is uh, the Lewis and Clark Expedition. Here they are. I believe they're meeting the Bella Coola um, on the Columbia River. And uh, no, Bella Coola are a lot further north. Anyway, they're meeting some of the locals on the uh, Columbia River. We happen to be from a little further north than that in uh, Puget Sound. but. Same basic. Me uh, meaning Gordon culture. myself. Yeah, the two of us <laughs> are from. We're from the far, far west, as opposed to this as being the far west. At any rate, that was the first major expedition to the uh, American West that really opened up the ideas of what could be done. And a lot of what they were looking for were gold mines. In fact, uh, Meriwether Lewis was probably murdered because people thought he'd found gold and wasn't talking to anybody. Uh, but also uh, furs specifically beaver fur, because it was worth an enormous amount of money. One of the primary weapons that the soldiers of Lewis and Clark's expedition brought with them was the standard United States flintlock musket, which was the infantry weapon uh, of the United States Army. And it was a dead-on copy of a French model 1768 musket. 69 caliber. I mean, even down to the fact that the U.S. military used metric threads until the 1890s because we copied the French. And the French in the 17, mid-1700s and on, of course, were using metric. So the U.S. Army was actually metric-based for the threads of their firearms. This is a pretty formidable weapon. So if the zombies do attack, this is what I'm back to. Yeah. Um, doesn't have to be loaded. It's heavy, and you've got a nice long pokey, which was discovered not to be that useful in the far west. But it carried a really heavy ball. It's a 69 caliber. Uh, it used a 63 caliber lead round ball. Uh, 63 caliber. The difference because, see that paper cartridge? It's just rolled up paper like a penny roll. It had the ball in one end, and it had the gunpowder at the top of that, and just fold it over, and a soldier would rip it open with his teeth. In fact, to be a soldier, he had to have at least two teeth that met. And he would use that to, part of it would go in here, priming the pan of your foot lock, and the rest would be stuffed down the muzzle to be rammed down. And a competent soldier could do four rounds a minute too bad. There actually is a reference uh, from, the sixth, or pardon me, the 1820s of an Iroquois who was in the employ of the Hudson's Bay Company in Oregon. That was, Oregon Territory was jointly owned by the United States and Britain at the time. And uh, a bear attacked this camp that some Americans and some of the uh, uh, Hudson's Bay Company guys were. And this Iroquois employee had a musket with a bayonet attached to it that he was just carrying around, and he attacked this grizzly bear uh, with his bayonet and dispatched it. So <laughs> they were carried by civilians. Okay. 
How much does that weigh? About 10 pounds. So infantry weapons haven't changed that much in weight for a long, long time. 10 pounds is about the maximum, so the military is sure to make sure it weighs that much at least. Um, but they weren't the preferred weapon of <coughs> civilians because although they were rapid fire and they're very effective against virtually everything you shot at, it wasn't very accurate. You might be accurate maybe if you, as one fellow said, if it wasn't exceedingly ill bored, uh, you might be accurate at up to 100 yards reasonably accurate <coughs> uh, minute of moose minute of angle is the, what they call it, call for for accuracy the minute of moose uh, past that it's uh, as this fellow said you might as well aim at the moon with the same hopes of hitting it most Americans civilians including Lewis and Clark themselves carried what were, were called at the time just an American rifle a long rifle because of the celebrated Kentucky Rifleman at the Battle of New Orleans, it's come down in history to us as being a Kentucky Rifle, but they're really a long rifle. You'll, you'll notice mine is abbreviated. Some idiot, some years ago, whacked his down. I took about 14 inches off it because these things are heavy, and I wanted to carry it around a lot, and so I turned it into a more Western rifle, which was done. But this is, that's a 69 caliber. This is a 45 caliber. They weigh about the same because the barrels are about the same outside diameter. It's made out of, it's not made out of steel, generally made out of soft iron. The reason for this is the soft iron dampen, and the heavy soft iron dampens vibration. What makes this different from a smoothbore musket is the rifling. And what rifling is, is it's grooves, concentric grooves that are cut into the barrel with a spin, okay? They, they rotate. And um, what it does is it rotates the bullet. It's still a round ball, and still what you use is a, either a very thin leather or paper, or a, pardon me, cloth patching to go between the ball and the, and the rifling to make sure that it will engage the rifling. At that point, you have go from a 100-yard gun to a two or 300-yard gun. Uh, the same after, officer I was talking about, Major Hanger of the British Army, he said that an American rifleman um, during one of the battles in the uh, uh, the South, the American South during the Revolution, at about 400 yards, started taking pot shots at him and um, <clears throat> Colonel Tarleton, Ban Bannister Tarleton. Uh, he said, yeah, he's going to make sport with us, I think. And as he said, he's going to make sport with us. Poof, the guy shoots, big cloud of smoke. And the um, trumpeter who was sitting on his horse, sort of behind them, but between them, uh, jumped off his horse and said, sir, my horse has been shot. Uh, at 400 yards in 1780, that was some good shooting. So the British definitely feared these. And so these were, that was the American rifle. They are developed actually by a combination of German gunsmiths from Pennsylvania uh, who brought the technology with them and short rifles, short large bore like 58, 70 caliber. And the American Scots-Irish or the Scottish borderers who came over and populated the Appalachians. And those people pretty much didn't have a lot of baggage holding them back so that works I want to go with that it made them longer and smaller bore because they uh, they didn't want to spend a lot of money on lead and powder and so this rifle works and I don't want to spend money I'm going to do that there's one of our heroes who's going to go shoot at Bannister Tarleton in fact uh, they, the, the ammunition was carried in a loose in a uh, powder horn shot pouch and so it took a while it took more like a minute to reload even if you knew what you're doing and you're pretty good at it it still took about a minute so military didn't like them because they took too long if you don't if you got time and you want accurate shooting that's what you do yes sir where did they get the idea to put the spit on the bullet uh from arrows uh they put uh, the fletching on arrows basically rifled them for a long time 
And somewhere around 1500, they started doing that with rifle, making rifle barrels. We know it, they come from at least then because there is a rifle made about 1500 for the Emperor Maximilian. Before he was emperor, it's got his coat of arms on it. And so, like, oh, well, we know when that was made. And it's rifle. How cool is that? So they've been doing this for a long time, sir. Is it true that they started rifling as a method to control powder fouling? Yes, because there are some straight rifled ones earlier. Uh, most of them, though, they say, hey, you know, if we make this thin, it's not going to be any more work to make it, you know, grooves, the grooves uh, twist. Let's try it. Hey, it works. At first, though, they took an oversized lead ball and pounded it in with a mallet and an iron ramrod. That takes longer. The standard of the Native American trade through mm -hmm. this period, and although I've got, um, say, 1700, actually starting about 1680, maybe even earlier, was a thing we refer to as a Northwest fusil, or an Indian trade musket. Um, pretty much a very light little musket. This one is uh, 20 gauge or 62 caliber. A lot of them were 56 caliber, <coughs> the trade caliber. Some of them were bigger. Some of them were just military muskets that had been past their prime and were traded off to the Native Americans. Uh, but the Native Americans, the Indians, were they had certain things that they wanted to see in a firearm, one of which was this serpent on the back. If they didn't have the serpent, they generally weren't interested. No, that means quality. I don't want that. That other one, that's junk. So um, most of the Native Americans, and actually a lot of Canadians, carried these. When I say Canadian, rabbit hole, the French population of the Mississippi Valley when the United States bought Louisiana, were generally referred to by Americans as Canadians. So when you hear about all oh, these Canadian fur trappers who were doing X in, say, you know, Colorado, they weren't from Canada. They were probably from St. Louis or someplace like that. So there have been a lot of attempts. I don't own one of those because they're hideously expensive. Um, a lot of attempts at increasing firepower, and that's going to be one of our themes here, is increasing firepower. One of the earliest ways to do it was have two barrels. Uh, there were revolvers, and there were multi-barreled guns, and all kinds of things from way, way back, in the earliest days of handheld firearms. But a double barrel seems to have been the most useful. It didn't become really popular until the British developed uh, really complexly engineered uh, breaches in the inside to make, make the gunpowder explode more efficiently so you could have a shorter barrel. Because a double barrel musket like this long is really heavy. But a double barrel musket or double barrel flint lock that's that long is pretty handy. And they still make them approximately that long. You can go to a gun store today and buy yourself a double barrel shotgun. A very popular um, firearm for sporting use, <coughs> and they go way back. Okay. The other way of increasing your firepower is to carry a spare, and the spare <coughs> is often a pistol. Now, notice the holsters that go with these pistols. They're not the kind of thing that you carry on your person, they go on your horse. The very first pistols were designed for horsemen. In fact, uh, during the 16th century, it was the, the pistolier that drove the mounted knight, armored knight, from the field. It wasn't a musketeer, because they could, uh, knights could stay out of range, and horses can cover territory real fast. Oh, they fired a volley, now we can charge. But uh, they couldn't stay out away from the pistoliers who were also mounted. And so, um, I think in the 80s, uh, museum in Austria said, hey, we got some old armor and we got some old pistols. Let's see what happens. And so they literally shot a p an armored black breastplate made in uh, 1574 with a pistol made in 1600. And at 15 feet, well, about three yards, went right through. Like a hot knife through butter. At 20 feet, it didn't. <laughs> So you had to be real careful as to what your range was. But oh, back up with one. I did want to 
point out one interesting thing. So for the guys who were into horse stuff and didn't get to talk about horses, notice those slots on this holster. These holsters fit across the pommel of your saddle. Those slots are for what's called a surcingle, which is like an extra girth that goes over the saddle. And make sure that if your girth breaks, you don't come off with your feet still in the stirrups, which is incredibly awkward having done that. OK. So if you don't want to carry a pair of these guys, or if you live in town, or if you're a lady who is afraid of vagabonds, ruffians, and cutthroats, etc., you can carry one of these little guys. They make cool little pocket pistols. Um, they were also called a muff pistol because a lady's muff keep her hands warm. Got your hands on your pistol, and this ruffian is accosting you. Guess what? Two neat things about this little guy. One is it's a breech loader. You unscrew the barrel, put your powder in, and put the ball on top. Screw it down, and the ball is actually a little bit bigger than bore size. So you get a lot more compression and therefore more velocity. The second is when you cock it, the trigger pops out. I think that's really cool. And we'll see this again. So it's just a, a neat little gun. There. Yes. Traveling? I mean, were they easy to go off, or was no. it something? Uh, they usually had an external safety plus an internal safety called half cock. Mm -hmm. But when they get worn, you go off half cock. Okay. So okay. you don't. So you, you want to make sure it's in good repair. Okay. Um, but yeah, they're pretty safe. We carry it with the hand, the cock down. Right? Yeah, then it's not loaded. You just yeah. unloaded it. What's the caliber? 56. Yeah, but they all kind of okay. So you said that it was a little bit bigger than the, the bore. So do they ever have problems with them exploding? Yeah. Uh, poor quality, quality ones, probably. It wouldn't surprise me. It wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why Britain and uh, a lot of other, and France and various other uh, countries had proof laws. And guns had to be proofed before they could be sold. However, unscrupulous dealers yeah. would have fake proof marks, and they'd do stuff from Germany or, or Belgium that didn't have a lot of proof laws until a little later. And so, yeah, those were, so there was a definite bias against stuff like that was made in uh, the low countries because a lot of it wasn't proof tested. OK, OK. Nick. Yep. Okay. So as we head out onto the plains, they noted that the, the, uh, our, our intrepid mountain men and whatnot, fur trappers, uh, uh, explorers and whatnot, noted that the long rifles were a little long. I know a fellow who actually had his long rifle on a trek, and he had it across his saddle, which is where you carry a rifle, right? A good place to carry your rifles right across there except he had a big long one. Uh, he made the mistake of cutting through some trees, between a couple of trees that were a little less wide than he thought, and um, broke the stock. Now, my experience with such things is when you run into trees and various things like that, you just end up off the saddle, and your horse goes that way, and you're sitting in the mud, uh, or flat on your back. As long as you keep your rifle up like that, you're OK. But. <clears throat> The, the Plains Rifle, which was developed primarily in St. Louis, took a lot of the uh, elements that English rifles, the English sporting rifles, were starting to display, such as a half stock. It made it a little stronger because less wood on it. Uh, this one actually is kind of neat. It's a 32 caliber. It's a real small bore. Most of the Plains Rifles were getting bigger bore because they're dealing with bigger animals than you dealt with in the east. In the east, you got black bear and deer. In the west, you've got grizzly bears and buffalo. So when you've got one shot, you want to make it count. So 50, 54, 58 was more the rule. So the gun started off big caliber, got smaller, got bigger. In the east coast, they're still 
I would say East Coast. That's anything west of the, or pardon me, east of the Mississippi. <laughs> east, it's East Coast. I guess it's that way. Anyway, um, one new thing, actually, in the Sutter's Fort collection, which I spent a lot of time in some years ago in California, a lot of the rifles in their collection that came across in the gold rush or before are very small bore. So there's still a lot of small bore rifles being used because they were very efficient in the amount of gunpowder and lead you were using. But a new thing that was coming out in starting in the 1820s, which dealt actually dated back to around 1805, 07 was the use of percussives instead of flint ignition. Percussive was using, originally it was a fulminate of mercury. They tried using that as an explosive for sending the bullet out, and they discovered they blew up a lot of guns trying that. Um, but it worked really well for just hitting with literally a hammer. Hit it with a hammer, boom! Man, that'll set off gunpowder. So with a little copper cap, literally it looks like a cup, a little tiny little cup with this fulminate of mercury that they put in wet and then put a paper pat thing over the top and then uh, a drop of a varnish to waterproof it. And all of a sudden, you have a much more efficient and reliable and somewhat waterproof means of igniting your rifle. So this became rifles that looked like this, about this size and weight, became pretty much the standard in the West from Somewhere in the 15 or somewhere in the 1820s till really about the end of the Civil War, or 1870 or so, when repeaters started coming in. But these were a very, very popular rifle and became pretty much ubiquitous in the West. Okay, let's go. Oh yeah, here's some of the stuff. You notice it's a little different from the shot pouch and powder horn of the uh, Revolutionary period. That's a buffalo horn <laughs> with an automatic charger. You can actually measure the charge of your gunpowder. Modern shooters don't like doing that, going straight from their powder horn into the barrel, because sometimes there's a spark down in there, and you're carrying a hand grenade in your hand, and really awkward stuff happens. Um, but he's got the tools necessary for keeping him in the field. He's got a mold, which is that nutcracker-looking thing. Um, a worm, which is, you know what, ramrods make really handy pointer sticks, since I neglected to bring my pointer stick. That's a uh, mold. That's a uh, little thing for, for cleaning out your vent, the, the, what they call a nipple or a cone for your percussion thing. That's a worm for attaching to your ramrod for drawing a charge. Uh, and that's also another worm. And that one, I can't tell from here. Anyway, stuff to keep your firearm working in the field when you're several hundred miles away from uh, any help. There were other means of trying to increase firepower. Um, well, we're back to the the um, cap lock shotgun. They increased the efficiency by going to per the percussion system. In fact, this little guy here is commonly used. You fill those little holes with the cap, and then if you put it in the right spot, you can cap your weapon pretty quickly. Uh, the shot pouch or shot bag is for carrying shot, and it will measure the proper amount to put in there. So you have your, your powder charge, charger and shot pouch and carry some wads in your pocket and caps and you're good to go. Notice I'm carrying a spare stick. Most guys in the West carried what they called a wiping stick. It wasn't a ramrod, it's a wiping stick. And almost every rifle had one because you also had your ramrod which went under the barrel. That's because if you broke one, you still had another one. Because if you're there without one, it's not going to work so good. You got to put that. The bullet has to go all the way down and has to seat against the gunpowder. Because if it doesn't, if you leave an air, leave an air space, the pressure buildup will probably blow up your gun. So 
some of the uh, you know, both Indians and many of the uh, Canadians, so-called Canadians, who were in the buffalo hunting industry for hides or whatever, or tongues, carrying these, usually cut short, they just, they'd have a powder horn and they'd stick half a dozen bullets, their lead ball in their mouth, jump up on their pony and chase off after the buffalo. And to reload it, have a, there's a little vent here between your powder charge on the priming and your main charge. They just bore that out so it's nice and big. So you just close it to half cock, take your powder horn, or in what you thought was about right, on a galloping horse. <laughs> Spit the ball down, whack the butt on the pommel of your saddle, which seated the ball, hopefully, and primed it, hopefully. And then before the ball rolled all the way out, right next to the buffalo and shooting. Uh, needless to say, there were a lot of uh, Indians and Canadians with a mangled left hand and pockmarked face from powder burns from the things blowing up on Because if that ball rolled out and <laughs> actually started rolling, it might blow up. Um, or if they put in twice as much powder as it was you know, able to, or whatever. Because how do you gauge? How do you know how much you put in there? No idea. But, um, you know, they lived fast and loose and, um, you know, took life as it came. Back to, where did I put it? There it is. This one, in particular, I'm very proud of. This is a cool gun. It has an old-style German patch box, literally for putting patches in. Oh, wait a minute, that's a shotgun, not a rifle. Okay. Yeah. Notice where this wiping stick comes. It's further down. This barrel is rifled, this barrel is smooth. This barrel is rifled, has a post coming up from the center, in the center of the um, chamber there. And it was only used for about five or 10 years. It's called a rifle a tige. You put in your powder charge, you dropped in your ball, and then you whacked it with your ramrod several times to make the ball spread out into the rifle. The French idea, this is not a French firearm, but I believe it is South African. Um, it's got a baobab tree on it, that's why <laughs> engraved on it, and I got it from a guy who said he got it in South Africa. So I'm assuming it's South African. Um, so it's got rifle sights, and both are the same size core, so you could use shot in that one side if you chose to, or you could put a 62 caliber round ball in both of them. Now what's really cool is they regulated rifles, okay? Double barrel rifles were regulated so that they would shoot at the same spot with the same bullet charge at a given distance. Like at say 50 yards, they both hit in exactly the same place. And if you, um, it was very difficult to do to get it right. But it's helpful for knowing where your, you know, your bullets are going. This one is regulated so that the sight picture for being dead on at 100 yards with the rifle is exactly the same sight picture as the smoothbore for 50 yards. So I call this my lion gun. I figure he shoots at it at 100 yards. By the time it comes back down for the second shot, he's at 50 yards. <laughs> and you hope that somebody else is with you to take care of him if you miss one or both of your of your uh, shots. Okay, there's other ways of trying to get more bullets downrange. This is a what they generally generally refer to as a harmonica gun for fairly obvious reasons. Um, it was built by a uh, a local fellow, uh, Jonathan Browning, John Browning's father. Jonathan Browning was a gunsmith in Illinois prior to the Mormon migration, uh, but he continued his trade here, and if you go up to Ogden to the Browning Museum, you all see that guy there. And he was quite well known for manufacturing these harmonica rifles. Do they have one of those up in Ogden? Yeah. Uh, and it, I think that's the one. 
but they were um, they have a little lever underneath uh, right next to the trigger guard that you'd use to tighten it up against the breech face and you and just move it I mean you go boom, 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 like a harmonica and this is what about a five shooter I think um, hey it's a it's a really cool idea a little bit awkward but you know you could carry three or four of those things with you and if you really needed firepower there it is it's just it was kind of an expensive way to go about it okay okay now we get into high tech a new way of going uh, getting more firepower as I mentioned the uh, revolver is, was not a new idea. Revolvers had been manufactured even as early as matchlocks in the early 1500s. But they really didn't go very far. I mean, it was just sort of an awkward, because you had to do it by hand, you know? There's all kinds of stuff you had to do. Like with the harmonica rifle, it wasn't just a boom, boom, boom. Uh, or like, like with a double barrel gun, you could just go boom, boom. This one, the early revolvers took a little bit of doing. Sam Colt actually probably copied a, a British, American British invention called a collier, but wasn't too successful, but there were a few around. But he improved the whole idea, and having the percussion system is what made it all work. Um, I like that hiding trigger, holding trigger. Um, it's a five shooter, not a six shooter. Colt came out with this in 1836. Um, this is the holster size pistol. This is the big one, 36 caliber. They went to much smaller ones, little 28s. They're called a Baby Patterson. Patterson, New Jersey being where they were manufactured. And um, this is a slightly later pattern because it comes with a loading lever. Uh, makes it a lot handier to actually push down the bullet which again was a little bit oversized. But you'll notice in this cased pistol, it's got a spare cylinder because you could pull that out. A swap cylinder. So not only was it a five shooter, it could be a 10 shooter reasonably quickly. Although doing that on a galloping horse is probably not my idea of a good time. <laughs> there was one fellow who's a, um, an editor of the New Orleans Picayune was on a buffalo hunt. He borrowed one of these, a 36 caliber pistol for a buffalo hunt. <laughs> and he said he was about to shoot when he noticed the barrel come off. <laughs> so he spent several hours searching for it so he could return the gun in, in, in one piece. Um, but these became very, very popular in Texas. The Texans uh, had declared their independence they're basically a bunch of, of Americans who've been invited into Texas to be a screen against the Comanches who were invading Mexico, constantly raiding into Mexico. And these Americans decided they liked being Americans better than being Mexicans. So, and also because of political issues in Mexico, especially um, the El Presidente General um, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, who declared himself basically a dictator. Now, we don't like dictators. So along with the states of Coahuila, Zacatecas, uh, Yucatan, California, and half a dozen other Mexican provinces, um, the Texans revolted. <coughs> Santa Ana made sure he was much more uh, thorough in trying to deal with the Texans, uh, to put down that revolution. But instead, he managed to get himself captured at the Battle of San Jacinto. And Texas became an independent republic in 1836. Um, but they still had a tough time, not only dealing with you know, a couple of incursions from Mexico uh, in the 18, early 1840s, but mostly it was against the Comanches and the Kiowa. This was the first firearm that anybody come up with that put an American or Anglo-American horseman on par with a Comanche with a bow. Okay, Stone Age Comanches on horseback had more shooting power, not firepower, because you don't fire bows, you shoot them. But <clears throat> you got five shots. There was a, um, time for this story, maybe. <clears throat> 
The first entity to buy these Colt's revolvers in any kind of numbers was the Republic of Texas's Navy. They bought a bunch of these little revolvers and also carbines. I saw in the last, you want to pop back to the last one just a second. Um, the Patterson carbines. They did this in 1839. In 1843, Texas loaned out their navy to the Republic of the Yucatan. Okay. And in a two-day fight, uh, the Battle of Campeche, the Texas and Yucatan navies defeated the Mexican, the Republic of Mexico's navy. It's kind of cool because the Republic of Mexico had steamships. Texans and Yucatanians did not. But, and also, Mexico had British officers in charge. Um, and so the Texans and the Yucatanians defeated the Mexican Navy. So Samuel Colt was very pleased with that. But on the way home, the president of, of uh, Texas, Sam Houston, decided he didn't like navies. They were too expensive. And so he, he um, disbanded the Navy and declared anybody that was still at sea, which was most of the Texas Navy, were pirates. And yeah, that was Sam Houston. He was interesting. Most Texans don't like him for some odd reason. Anyway, so all the pistols that they had got taken from the ships and put into storage. The next year, 1844, a Texas Ranger captain by the name of Jack Hayes discovered that, hey, there's all these cool pistols that are being unused. Sam Colt had given a pair of smaller pistols to a Texas merchant in hopes of getting some business. And that guy had passed them on to Jack Hayes. And Jack Hayes said, these are cool. Wow, there's like 150 of these or more in storage in Austin. I'm getting my hands on some of those. So he issued these out to his rangers, a pair of them each. And each one, each one of these rangers had generally a flintlock horse pistol or two and a flintlock long rifle. And they went out hunting Comanches, and they found them. They found 80 Comanches. Uh, usually, if there was 15 rangers found 80 Comanches, there'd be 15 scalp locks hanging off the Comanche war bridles. <laughs> In this case, it didn't work because of these guys. And you got to remember, in in our concept of firearms, was like, oh, boom, 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 throw them out. Their com concept of firearms was boom. Okay, next gun. But it's boom. I still got four more rounds left. This is cool. Boom! I've still got three more rounds left. This is cool. And with a pair of these, they've got 10 ready shots, plus their pair of pistols, plus their rifles. And the Comanches kept expecting they're going to fire at us. They might get two volleys off. Then we're going to rush in, and we're going to kill them all. And the Texans just didn't run out of ammunition. They didn't run out of shots. It's like, this is wrong. And so the Comanches <laughs> said, OK, you know, we're done with this and left, they managed to collect most of their dead. But the fact that the, that the Rangers actually got, came home meant that this was an enormous victory for Texas. Two years later, actually, yeah, almost two years later, the um, Republic of Texas became no more and was annexed to the United States. Uh, I could go in that rabbit hole for a long time if you wanted. But um, as part of the United States now, Texas um, military became, was able to draw on resources of the United States Army. James K. Polk, President of the United States, wanted to get into a war with Mexico uh, for various reasons, mostly to get San Francisco Bay. But um, they, re uh, they recruited a number of uh, Texans to be scouts. In fact, they re ended up raising an entire regiment of Texans. Uh, two regiments, one of which, but they're basically called Texas Rangers, because most of them had been Texas Rangers. And oh yeah, I wanted to mention one thing. Eh, pistol case. Holsters are the things that go on your saddle. If you carry it on your belt, it's either a belt case or a pistol case until basically the Civil War. So if you're writing something from before the Civil War, he's got it on his, hol on his belt, it's, you should be calling it a pistol case. OK. So, in 1846, one of Jack Hayes's guys, a guy by the name of Sam Walker, was 
second, well, he be, got a commission in the United States Mounted Rifles, the, now the third cavalry. Uh, and one of the things he desperately wanted for his troops were these Colt's revolvers. Plus, the Texans wanted these Colt's revolvers. Colt had actually gone out of business in 1842 because nobody wanted these things. He only sold, you know, a few thousand of them. But Walker never said, oh, well, Sam Walker, oh yeah, well, how come a captain got all, had all this uh, influence, right? Well, his brother was the senior senator from Maryland. <laughs> influence, right? Okay, we, we forget about this. There's, there's nothing new in DC. Uh, and so he had some influence. So he actually was given authority by the War Department and the War Department is what they used to call, you know, Department of the Army uh, before it was in the Pentagon. And he, fa he looked up Colt. Said, Colt said, no, I don't have it. I don't even have a model left anymore. Uh, I don't have any manufacturing stuff. Uh, I don't know. They said, well, let's, let's redesign it, and we'll, we're going to go to Eli Whitney, who's going to build these things. So they redesigned this guy, the little little bitty Patterson 36, into a true horse pistol. It was 44 caliber, took a, almost a 60 grain charge, which is the same as the US rifles took. 44 and a bullet instead of a round ball. And this thing would not only go through a Comanche war shield, it'd go through a horse. So you could stop a Comanche, you could stop his horse, um, and that's one of the things that we find as we keep going is the army wants heavy caliber firearms for the most part. Not so much to stop an opponent, but they're mostly purchased for cavalry and you want to be able to shoot your horse or somebody else's horse if you have to. So these guys, which were, <laughs> when they first got them, well, 1847 Colt's revolver called a Walker, um, the guys who used them said, man, this will outshoot a rifle at 100 yards, which they would do. So this was a huge leap in technology, an enormous leap in technology. You've got a six-shooter, a 44, and needless to say, it became enormously popular on the Western frontier. This one and its, uh, its uh, descendants. Ours, of course, in the Civil War and later in Texas, when uh, all these uh, Missouri bushwhackers moved in there, Josie Wales, that's right, outlaw Josie Wales. Anyway, um, there's a nice original pistol case. This is what the Walker pistols came with. That's actually a gang mold for what was issued to the bunch of them. Um, so these were a huge success. They only made like 1,100 of them, but they had huge influence. You said that it was a six-shooter? Mm -hmm. Did it also have the removable cylinder? Or? Yes, you could. It wasn't designed to. To generally, it wasn't designed to have a spare cylinder, but for cleaning purposes, you could still, yeah. you could still tear it apart like that. But they figured if you needed more than six shots, you were probably in the wrong neighborhood. And they were actually designed originally to be carried with in pairs, although I don't know if they ever actually issued them that way. Uh, here's a couple of interesting characters with them. Rip Ford was actually the adjutant of Jack Hayes' regiment of Texas Mounted Volunteers um, in Mexico. The reason they called him Rip was because he signed an awful lot of letters, RIP. He was the guy that got to write home to the families that their son or whatever their relative had been killed in combat. Anyway, he ended up with the nickname of Rip Ford. And he says in his, in his book that I helped myself to a pair of the big new Colt pistols. Um, and there they are. <laughs> There's a photograph of him 10 years later carrying the thing still. Because that that's a big hunk of pistol hanging off your hip. But with that narrow little belt, that must have really dug in good. And then there's a couple of Californios, uh, one of which, well, probably Americans in California dress in California circa, you know, gold rush. Uh, and a fellow on the, you're right, <laughs> um, has a big old Walker pistol in that holster. Um, 
pretty quickly people discovered that's too long. So they bobbed them down. And when uh, Colt started manufacturing things on his own, not from Eli Whitney, but with his, his own factory, uh, he took some advice from the um, uh, ordnance department and made them smaller. The first thing they did was, well, first thing was bob them down to a seven inch barrel instead of nine and a half. The next thing is they made the cylinder a little shorter because they did blow up some of these. Probably from guys taking a bullet and putting in it backwards. If you put a bullet, it turns it into a little shaped charge and then things go poorly with the not great metallurgy. Um, but they bobbed up, they made them a little bit smaller. Same frame, a little bit smaller. And uh, they made those until uh, basically the beginning of the Civil War. And they were extremely popular in the West um, and in Australia as well. Australia had a uh, 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 gold rush at the same time. Okay. Yeah. So the even shorter one then is the Dragoon? Yep, the short one is the Dragoon. Now, <clears throat> with the gold rush, and of course, we have the image of Mississippi River boat gamblers who are also on the Missouri River. Uh, hideouts became, or should I say, we're still popular. This is what they call a, well, it's a derringer. The first one's like this. Just It's just a small percussion pistol. But it's designed so you just have one finger goes around the grip like that. And uh, Henry Derringer, one arm, was the guy who basically made them famous. Copiers would put two R's in there so they didn't get patent infringement issues. And so it became a Derringer with two R's instead of a Derringer with one R. Anyway, um, lots and lots of people in civilian life, well, civilian life, city life would carry a pair of these in their pockets, one in each side. In fact, like in San Francisco, in, in, during the gold rush, it was said that if you were talking to a fellow and he had both his hands in his pockets, it was assumed that he had a pistol in each hand. He had a derringer in each hand. If need be, just shoot right through his coat pocket. Hard on the coats, but it works. So these little Philly derringers, called a Philadelphia derringer because Henry Derringer was in Philadelphia. Uh, and they just became kind of ubiquitous um, up through the Civil War era as a hideout. Now, there's one famous individual who was shot with one of these. Uh, you probably heard the uh, uh, the joke about, aside from that, how was the play, Mrs. Lincoln? Um, this is what ruined that play, one of these. This is what Jane, uh, uh, what's his name? John Wilkes Booth. John Wilkes Booth, not Jane. Uh, yeah, John Wilkes Booth shot Lincoln with was one virtually identical to this. So obviously they were. <laughs> How close was he when he shot him? About like that. Yeah. Hey, he worked better at close range. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, uh, how accurate were the derringers? Like how they were actually rifled. They're rifled. So they, you know, aside from the fact that they don't have real sights, um, I mean, they would, at, from here to the, to the door, you know, you could be pretty sure of hitting your target if you practiced at all. So. At this point, were they moving away from gun you know, powder, a uh, separate gun powder, or is I'm it? I'm getting there. Okay, I just—it's like I haven't seen the, the powder horn in a while, and I was yeah. wondering at what point was that? Was We're still using powder. powder horns or flasks, okay. you know, metal flasks like the Walker came with. Um, derringers, actually, a lot of times guys would just—they wouldn't have any of that stuff. They'd take it to a gunsmith to be loaded. And then they just carry a loaded gun around. If they shot it, they'd go back to a gunsmith and say, hey, clean it and load it for me. Uh, a lot of the guys that got themselves lynched in San Francisco was by the Vigilance Committee uh, operated like that. They, so, um, now, 1851, Colt came out with what they called their new Ranger model uh, in 36 caliber. But because of, remember that Battle of Campeche, the Texas Navy? He wanted to commemorate that, so he had it engraved on the cylinders here, a little battle scene of sailing ships shooting it out. And so people bought it and said, oh, that's a naval scene. This must be a naval gun. So it got the nickname of Navy, and eventually Colt said, okay, it's a Navy Colt. Um, but this, they made 200,000 of these uh, between 1850 and 1873. 
um, not only at Colt's Hartford factory, but also a London factory. He, they were popular enough that he opened up a factory in London that sold another bunch of thousands. And they were still being, even though they stopped making them in 1873, they were still selling these up into the 1880s until they ran out uh, to people who were like going to Africa. Because you could get gunpowder, you could buy lead, and you could buy caps almost anywhere on the continent, any semi-civilized place. But if you had a cartridge gun, who knows if you're going to get a cartridge for your gun. But this, you could keep running in almost any conditions. So they remained, they retained a lot of their popularity. And that's a little Slim Jim holster, a little civilian holster pistol case um, that was very popular. They started getting engraving. Um, a lot of the uh, Mexican uh, leather workers would do this, and that popularized that whole notion. The British had a, um, came up with a competitor to Colt, uh, a fellow by the name of uh, Adams, uh, and he invented a, what's called double action. Um, this is a self cocker because there's no hammer or spur. You notice you, there's no, nothing to cock the hammer with. You just pull the trigger, dunk, 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 dunk. There's a five shooter, but bigger bore. Um, up to a 50 caliber. And the British decided they liked these a little better because they were a little faster for close work. Because they were all over the world, they didn't feel like accuracy at 100 yards was a, in, was a necessary thing. Um, but they thought that stopping power at 10 yards was. Uh, and especially in such things like the, um, the Indian Mutiny of uh, 1857. Some call it, some's called the Sepoy Mutiny. Uh, the British were in some real tight fights with some people who really didn't like them, carrying swords and stuff. Uh, and so they liked having something that was really fast to operate. You didn't have to cock it each and every time. Okay. Now, again, moving on in firepower, Christian Sharps, who would, a rabbit hole I'm not going to go down into, was the U.S. Dragoons in 1833, U.S. Cavalry adopted a breech loader called a Hall rifle, or Hall's carbine. Not going there. It was the first percussion weapon adopted by the U.S. Army. But it, we'll talk about it at a later time. Um, but Christian Sharps came up with, he improved it. I thought, you know, we can make a breech loader. It sort of works like that. In fact, most, most modern artillery Rapid fire artillery uses the same action. And it would take a similar type paper cartridge with a bullet, slightly undersized or slightly oversized bullet, paper with the, the gunpowder in it, and you just push it in there, and there's a sharp knife edge on the edge of the breech, and it would slice off the back end of it. You put your percussion cap on there, and boom. And the U.S. Army was very interested, and it became the standard U.S. carbine during the Civil War, for the most part. A little shorter guns. This is a full rifle size, sporting rifle. Um, but they were very pop. They were <laughs> Harriet Beecher Stowe, the lady who wrote Tom, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, her brother, um, let's see, her father was Lyman Beecher, brother was, anyway. Ward Beecher. Uh, Ward? Henry, yeah, yeah, that's him. He, he took his to church, right? He was preaching at church, and so he brought his Sharps rifle with him, and he held it up and he said, there is more righteousness in one of these rifles than in the entire Bible. Well, he's talking about the abolition movement in Kansas. And they, hang on a sec, and they sent, New England Abolition Society started sending Sharps rifles to the abolitionists, the free staters in Kansas, in the 1850s, and these became known as Beecher's Bibles. <laughs> so it's kind of cool, Beecher's Bibles. And if there, you can imagine how much righteousness there must have been in the case of these things. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a question, young man? Excellent. <laughs> Get him started young. <laughs> okay, so we'll put that on hold for a second. Oh yeah, pin fire. Uh, this is one of the earliest self-contained cartridges. 
Uh, it's all brass. You'll notice that there's a pin and a, one of these little percussion caps inside. And when the flat end of a hammer whaps it, it, it goes off. The French started building these in either single shot, two shot, or revolvers in the, um, well, actually the one or two shooters in the 1840s, revolvers in the 1850s. In fact, this is a small version of what the French adopted as their standard service revolver, service pistol, in 1854. We're still messing around with cap and ball revolvers for another 20 years. The French are issuing a cartridge pistol, a cartridge revolver, in the 1850s, the mid-1850s. Um, they're very serviceable. The US Army, uh, during the Civil War, bought lots of them. And they were very well liked. Because guess what? You don't have to carry all this junk with you. Uh, actually, the Army usually issued um, cartridges that were made out of, um, um, out of big intestine. Uh, so that you'd be attached to the bullet, and you'd have a little bit of powder. You put it in there, you ram it with the rammer, and uh, then you have to cap it. Very frail, very awkward. You don't do it on horseback. You got six shots for a battle. You're not going to go back and uh, reload it with any uh, any real quickness. But okay, let's go forward. But oh yeah, In 18 <coughs> late 1840s. The French again. The French are working with uh, how do we con how do we make a musket more accurate? How do we put rifling in a musket without ruining the speed of loading? One of the things they tried was that atige idea with the post, but eventually a, um, a captain of ordnance, Captain Claude, de, uh, Claude Minet, came up with the idea of a bullet with the hollow base in it. So it's it just a a lead ball looks exactly like a bullet today. It's just had a hollow base. And you drop that down your bore, when it goes off, boom, that little skirt of lead expands into the rifling, and off it goes. Um, quite accurate. By the early 1850s, the British had adopted their um, Enfield rifle musket, and we didn't want to be too far behind the um, the times, and in 1855, we adopted the same thing. This is a little artillery carbine. Um, um, but, which were actually used widely by Confederate cavalry, because the ammo was easy to get a hold of, because the Confederate Army was pretty much standardized on these infield rifled muskets. Um, they, most of them were still big long things for the infantry. But it was a much faster way of getting a accurate, uh, an accurate shot. And so the Civil War, one of the reasons the Civil War was so horribly bloody was because they were using rifles that you could hit a target with at 500 yards, trying to shoot at each other at 60 or 70 yards or closer, so that every bullet actually hit what it was intended to hit. Um, and so you'd have whole, like at Gettysburg, after Gettysburg, you'd have whole rows of guys who are just dead. And then, oh, they're just lying down. They can't, no, they're dead. Um, because there's a volley, boom, all of those guys go down. Um, and they, if they felt like it, they could start at long range, but they usually didn't. Um, just because it takes a while for the brain. World War I's a good example of this. Takes a while for the commander's brains to catch up with technology. Um, during the Civil War, uh, the Colt actually managed to put a 44 caliber barrel and cylinder on the little Navy frame. Came the 1860 Army model. Army because it's a 44 caliber. Navy guns were all 36, right? Because it had well, this has a cylinder scene too. How come that's not a Navy? Well, it's an Army caliber of 44. Twenty-five dollars to the Army. Elijah Remington and Sons, uh, who've been in business since about 1816, I said, we'll make something that's a little better for 1250. And the Army said, sold. And so after 1863, the Army quit buying Colts and just bought Remingtons. 
Um, it has a lot of advantages over the Colt. It's a solid frame, you know, it doesn't come apart to take it apart. Uh, in fact, to take the cylinder out, you gotta go through a bit of a contortion. Not much of a contortion. But uh, if you wanted to carry spare cylinders, you could, although I don't know of any actually being manufactured spare cylinders. But the main thing was it was a stronger firearm. Um, still 44 caliber, but the Army was very pleased with these. Um, they're, it's a good solid gun, and when you whack somebody over the head, it's not going to break it. <laughs> On the other hand, a couple of guys, uh, Horace Smith and Daniel B. Wesson, were off working on other projects, and they came up with something that has been pretty influential. They came up with the 22 caliber cartridge, 22 rim fire. And this is their first firearm, which is a little bitty, well, the lower one, a uh, little bitty 22. Little lowly little 22. A lot of guys in the Civil War carried these because it's a 22. It doesn't have a lot of oomph, but it's got seven shots and you carry your, the cartridge in your pocket and it doesn't explode or anything so like that. So are we pretty much done with cap and ball by this point? Uh, no, they're still hanging on. So this is sort of a transition period where you've got yep. some cartridge guns and some cap and yep. ball. Yep, and we're still in the Civil War. These were getting popular, but the Army says not reliable enough. And anyway, who's going to carry a 22? A lot of guys did. But as one old mountain man said when he saw one, he said, well, somebody, somebody was to shoot me with one of those and I was to ever find out about it, I'd probably be pretty mad. <laughs> <laughs> and next one. Okay, so there's a, what a rim fire looks like. You've got your priming compound is literally in the rim of this folded uh, copper. It's made out of copper, so it's very uh, soft cartridge. It just be punched out and it's got it's, it's hollow in the, the base, the, the rim is hollow. And it's got priming compound put in there. Then they put in black powder, gun powder, and then the bullet. That's exactly how they make them today, except they use smokeless powder instead of black powder. And you can go to any, you can go to Walmart and buy the exact same thing, except it's modern powder, but they were, the Smith & Wesson developed in the 1850s. It's exactly the same thing. There were some other people out there who said, hey, this is a good idea, this rim fire, but it's too small. Let's make something bigger. Smith and Wesson had actually been working with a guy named Jennings a few years before and came up with a neat idea of using these cartridges with the lever action, but anyway, the cartridges they were using weren't quite right. It was a mini ball with just some priming compound in the butt, the ball called a volcanic. Didn't work so good. But, a guy named Oliver Winchester bought him out, hired a guy named B. Tyler Henry, Benjamin Tyler Henry, and hey, improve this. He said, I'm gonna convert it to make use these rim fires. And he came out with the Henry rifle. It's a Winchester, right? Well, no, it was a Henry. Um, standard lever action stuff. It's in a 44 caliber now. It took a Pretty big cartridge. I mean, the 44 cal cartridge took 28 grains of gunpowder, 26 grains of gunpowder. Uh, short, stubby thing, about the same power as a 45 automatic cartridge today. So really, it's just a big pistol cartridge that shoot. But it took 16 rounds. And as the Confederate said of the Union guys who were carrying them, that you, it's the gun you load on Sunday and shoot all week. <laughs> and you loaded it from the front. You, drop your cartridge in one by one from up here, and they'd fit down there and had the main, that was the biggest problem with one. Because there's this big groove there that can get all kinds of junk in it. However, there were a whole lot of people who said, that is cool, I'm getting me one. Um, soldiers uh, who would personally purchase them and carry them in the Civil War. There were, um, <coughs> entire regiments who would pool their money and buy them. So to the point where the Ordnance Department of the U.S. Army had to start buying the ammunition to supply these guys. And they were becoming quite popular out west. Uh, in 1866, there was an incident called the Fetterman Massacre, uh, or Fetterman Fight, if you will. Uh, 
this uh, Captain Fetterman and I think 80 guys went out to fight the Sioux. Uh, none of them came back. But the two guys who had the biggest influence on that battle were two um, civilians were there, each of whom had a Henry rifle and a case of ammunition. They were found, the guns were gone, but there was a pile of ammo around each one of them. Pile, pile of expended shells. So, and a lot of guts of blood found in the snow around them. So, um, these were incredibly, it was a game changer. This is basically the assault rifle of the Civil War era. Um, no bayonet log, but still, uh, it's the assault rifle because you could blast away a lot. A fellow named Christopher Spencer came up with a similar idea about the same time. Uh, it's a lever action, but it had a side hammer and you had to cock that for each and every shot. It was a little sturdier. Not as reliable, but sturdier. Uh, and it had the magazine in the butt. So the magazines on the um, Henry's were under the barrel. The magazine of the Spencer was in the butt. Both of them needed, required a flat-nosed bullet because when you're putting stuff up against your priming compound of the cartridge in front of you, you don't want it real pointy. Yeah. The awkwardness. Did issue. I mislabel that? Oh, no, you did. There's, oh, yeah, you did. That's a Spencer. Yeah, that is not a Henry. That is a Spencer. Well, the other cutaway is a Henry. Oh, okay. One's a Henry. That's a Spencer. Um, I'll fix it later. Anyway, they actually made a loading thing for the Henry rifle, for the uh, um, Spencer called a Blakesley quick loader. And there's a tube, a copper tube filled with cartridges. And you take the, um, don't break that. Um, so this thing actually fits in the butt. That's, that's your magazine. Uh, then you take that out, pull this tube out of a big box, dump in the cartridges, toss it, put the tube back in, the magazine back in, and then blaze away. You got seven shots. Uh, it's 56, uh, 56 caliber. Uh, later they improved it to, they necked it down a little bit to 50 caliber. Still took 45 grains of powder. And so it was a pretty impressive cartridge. And the um, U.S. Army loved them. Uh, they used them until 1873. And they were um, a very, very popular rifle or carbine because they gave the Army a lot of firepower. Not a lot of range. Neither one had a whole lot of range. 100 and some odd yards, maybe 200 yards for any kind of effective range. But you had a lot of shots. OK. OK. Oh, shoot. All right. Um, this is the improved model Henry, the 1866. Oliver, Oliver Winchester, who owned the place, he decided he wanted his name on it instead of Henry's name on it. The big change in the Winchester 66 from the Henry was uh, rather than loading it from up there, they cut a little slot here and put a plate, a spring-loaded plate, so that you could just put your cartridges in the side. That was an improvement because it kept all the crud out. Next. Still with the Derringers. This is Remington, again, a double Derringer. They started making these in 1868. It's a 41 caliber rimfire. They didn't stop making these until 1934. <laughs> oh, they were very, very popular. Uh, any of you guys are old enough to have watched Half Gun Will Travel? That's when he carried his spare gun, so I had to have one. <laughs> okay. So one of the, the big changes that started right after the Civil War was the adoption of center fire cartridges. You'll notice in this cutaway, well, first off, that's a mini ball. <laughs> that's, they were hollow uh, bullets. This is a Snyder cartridge from the British. Actually, it's an American design, but a British uh, rifle. And the very base of it, there's a percussion cap and a little anvil to go in there, and it made for a sturdier cartridge. Now, you'll notice this one is made up of a bunch of folded stuff. It's actually built like a modern shotgun cartridge with paper and a brass base. 
but that didn't last too long. They quickly discovered that it was better to have drawn brass. But it's that center fire that makes the difference because it's stronger. Uh, rim fire has only a certain amount of pressure it can take before it blows out. Uh, and one of the first guns that they converted to use anything was the sharps because it's already most of the way there. You know, I mean, you're stuffing something in the breech. And so gunsmiths would just uh, put a slot in there and, and a little dog leg looking firing pin. So the sharp starting in the 1867 or so started being converted in large numbers by the army. Uh, in fact, the, fellow, the fellows on the far end there have uh, uh, army sharps carbines that have been converted. This fellow has one, and then yeah, then we got Quigley down under. Um, this is, it became pretty much the quintessential buffalo gun because they were very sturdy, very accurate, and very powerful. And so buffalo hunters bought them in huge numbers. The longest recorded shot prior to our involvement in Afghanistan was actually by a guy named Billy Dixon. In 1874 at the Battle of Adobe Walls, he shot a Comanche off his horse at a counted and witnessed 1,538 yards. 50 caliber sharps. They said it was pure luck, but you've got to be darn good to be that lucky. <laughs> so the stuff that Quigley does in the movie is not fantasy. Billy Dixon. Billy Dixon. Really Billy Dixon. Yeah. Billy Dixon. So in 18, actually starting in 1865, the Army started experimenting with this. Um, in 1873, they adopted this particular one. Armies all over the world had the problem. We got these perfectly good muzzle loaders that are now obsolete. What do we do with them? Well, Erskine Allen of the uh, Springfield Armory said, hey, you know, we just hog a whole big chunk out of the back of that barrel and add a breech piece in here that somehow moves. We can convert them. And so the 1865 and 1866s were just converted muzzle loaders. Then they started making them fresh, but because the Army liked it. It's called a trap door carbine because guess what? It operates like a trap door. Um, you put in your cartridge there, cram it down in, and you fire it. Uh, this happens to be, this is the carbine version, obviously. Um, almost identical to the ones that Custer carried. The big difference is that this has a little butt trap in here for carrying a um, cleaning rod because it was found of Custer's guys that a lot of them got killed because cartridges got stuck in there. They couldn't get them out um, because they were carrying them in leather cartridge belts and they got all this green vertigris in there and it would sort of weld itself in there. And also the Army was cheap and was using copper cartridges. Army went over to brass cartridges and issuing <coughs> cleaning rods or ramrods to knock them out, and that solved the whole issue. This is the, stand, the, the 4570 cartridge. And the Army used this. Well, heck, they were still using this, issuing these to volunteer troops in the, the Spanish-American War in uh, 1898. Uh, Remington, still in the ball game, they came up with a whole different idea. It's called a rolling block. And we don't see a lot of these in the Americas or in North America, but everywhere else in the world you see scads of them. This one was, is actually sold to Egypt. Um, they're sort of like the AK-47 of the late 19th century because everybody had them. There's a Spanish one, there was the uh, Argentine, there's the Egyptian model, there's a Turkish model, you know, you name it. Um, usually in 11 millimeter or 43. Uh, and in the United States, if they sold these, they called it a 4477. Because it was a 44 caliber and 77 cartridge, uh, 77 grains of gunpowder. The 4570 meant 45 cartridge bullet, 70 grains of gunpowder. Uh, the Remington and Colt revolvers, again, they're a lot of the way to what you want for a cartridge revolver. So they had gunsmiths that just cut the back end of the cylinder off and make a little donut is a way to convert it, you know, to a spacer or a whole new uh, cylinder and you've got a cartridge gun. Remington, in fact, um, continued to make, to convert their older cartridge gun or percussion guns to cartridge until about 1875. And there's a, a couple of fellows there. One guy's got this really cool bikini holster with his cartridge conversion Colt stuffed in there. 
The gun that won the West. Actually, the Sharps is called the gun that made the, work the West safe for the Winchester. Um, <laughs> but not a lot of guys wanted to carry a big, heavy revolver. Uh, starting in the, about 1868, um, Webley of uh, London started manufacturing a very high quality cartridge revolver. Double action, which means you can cock it, that's one action, or self cock, double action. Uh, and these were very popular pocket pistols. This one is called a British Bulldog. Well, the Bulldog is a 44 caliber, so it's got a lot of bite, but it's not very big. It's kind of snubby. And the little puppy, is that the little pup? That's the 38 caliber version. So the pup was a 38, the Bulldog was a 44. And both were very popular. Again, carry it in your pocket. There's a reference to one guy, a cowboy, who had one of the small, slightly smaller versions of puppies. He had an elastic piece of cord. You tied it to his suspender, ran the cord down his sleeve, pushed the pistol up his sleeve, and just walked into a saloon carrying a, his cigarette. And the gambler who cheated him starts pulling out a pistol. He just tosses down the cigarette, throws his hand down, the pistol comes out, and boom. <laughs> Don't you do that. <laughs> OK. Um, back to Smith & Wesson. Uh, it became obvious that people wanted something bigger than a 22 or a 32 rimfire. So in 1869, they came out with their big American model, a big break open. I mean, it, it's very fast to operate, um, a 44. It was uh, interesting. It was very popular in the West. In the early days, in the early, uh, I'm saying in the 70s, Grand Duke Alexis of the uh, Imperial Russian family was visiting, and he was on a buffalo hunt. Both Buffalo Bill and um, one of his compadres, I think, it was uh, um, oh, um, well, Bill Hickok, were carrying these Smith and Wesson Americans. The Grand Duke said the Russian army needs these, and so he decided that that's what the Russian army was going to get. The Russian army said, these aren't quite good enough. We need some work. So they redesigned the cartridge from this big, this, well, what it was, to the Smith & Wesson American, pardon me, the Smith & Wesson Russian cartridge. And that's the basis for the 44 Special and the 44 Magnum that's still made today. If I want to shoot this, I just take some of those and cut them down and reload them. Um, it was extremely popular in the, in, in, obviously, in Russia and in Europe. Not as popular in the United States, although fairly popular. This gun is 149 numbers off of the one that uh, I believe Virgil Earp carried at the OK Corral. So pretty much he carried one of these. So they were well used. Not everybody carried a Colt. They should have. Um, <laughs> Winchester did some more improvements. Uh, this guy here is a Winchester 73. It finally took a center fire cartridge, uh, 4440. It's not super powerful, but out of a rifle, it's as powerful as a modern 44 Magnum, which is plenty for most things. And it, it, they sold it as a 600-yard gun. And stretching it a little bit, but not by a whole lot. Um, these were super, super popular. You could go anywhere in the West. If they sold any ammunition, they sold this stuff, 44 uh, Winchester. Um, it was sold in rifle lengths, carbine lengths, little short guys, uh, and pretty much everybody had one of these as part of his kit. Even if his main rifle was a right, you know, sharps, they still carried these because they were just generally a fine, fine weapon. Uh, one thing I didn't put a thing into. Doubles were still popular. This is a Colt made in 18, or an 1878 made in 1883, a 10 gauge. That's a big friggin' cartridge. And this is a really heavy gun. It's not for ducks, this is for geese. But the form didn't change. Function changed, form does not. So there's, there's, there's this linear conservativeness in weapons. Uh, you even see that in the changeover from, bron from stone to bronze to iron weapons. The forms stay the same, the materials change. Now, one of my favorites, the Colt, well, 1873 Single Action Army. 
This introduces the 45 Colt cartridge, which you can still go buy today. Army used this from 1873 well into, I mean, they were still issuing them out. I mean, New York National Guard was still using these in the 19-teens. Um, and it's sort of the ubiquitous cowboy gun. Part of the reason it's ubiquitous is because they were extremely popular. Part of the reason is because in the 1920s, the Army was selling a bunch of these off surplus, and the studios bought them, and that's what they had their tar their cowboys for. So the slightly shorter barrel one, that was the artillery model, that was the cowboy gun, because that's what they had. Um, ranchers, cowboys, farmers, cavalrymen, you name it, carried these because they were not as fast to reload as a Smith & Wesson, but sturdier and um, a little cheaper, too. Um, this particular one was made in 1885. It's still got those cool little U.S. stamps on it. Um, but a, a heck of a good gun. And when you hit people with it again, it doesn't end <laughs> Remington got into the mix, 1875. But they wanted to keep, there's no reason for this web to be here, but their, their uh, percussion pistols had it, and they wanted to differentiate themselves from Colt. This one, though, they were smart. They didn't make this in 45 caliber. <coughs> I think you had to go buy a specific one. They made it in 44 Winchester. So somebody could carry one cartridge that fit both his rifle and his pistol. Colt in 1878, hey, that's a good idea. We're going to do that, too. But Remington beat him to the punch. Uh, and the guy that the Boy Scouts is designed after, is patterned after, a guy named Frederick Burnham, when he was a cowboy in Arizona and later as a scout in South Africa, this is what he carried. He carried one just like this, except he had uh, hippopotamus ivory on it later on. Um, oh yeah, 1876 Winchester. <clears throat> Built basically like the 73, except big. Uh, to big up, take a 45-75 cartridge, light bullet, but a heavy powder charge, and you got our heroes there. Um, Teddy Roosevelt striking an attitude um, in his uh, Western garb, his Western hunter's garb. And next, <clears throat> it was also adopted by the Mounties. 1876, Winchester was adopted by the Northwest Mounted Police, and these guys in proper uniform and then looking like standard cowboys running around in Alberta. The only difference is that uh, they have different looking pistols, cases, and uh, extra ammo. Other than that, most Mounties look like cowboys. And of course, there's <coughs> one of our guys in there. Oh, uh, Tom Selleck. Yeah, Selleck in Crossfire Trail carrying one of those. You can see how big those guns are. They're just a big, big rifle. And that's only the carbine. But they were, Mounties actually like those better than uh, uh, their later Enfields. Sharps was still in the gun making business uh, for another few years, and a guy named Hugo Borchardt developed one that was hammerless. The only reason I'm putting that out there is because I want you to remember the name Borchardt, Hugo Borchardt. Next. There was more interest in making multi shot weapons. Uh, the Navy actually adopted and um, the Army experimented with various multi shot weapons. Uh, both of these rifles, the Remington Keen, which has an external hammer, the bolt action was an external hammer, and the Winchester Hotchkiss still have that uh, magazine in the butt. Okay, they're still playing with that because they know that, you know, as your weight changes in the front, it changes your point of aim. So they wanted to not do that, so they put the, the, the magazine still in the butt, still a tube magazine in the butt. However, Excuse me. Next. Uh, a guy by the name of James Paris Lee came up with a neat idea called a box magazine. Detachable box magazine. And the US Navy adopted a version in 1879 and then more in 1885, which was slightly improved. This is an 85 version of carbine. The British used basically <laughs> hardly changed from this up until 1957. Uh, the 303 with double stack and 10 shot magazine instead of a 5. Other than that, this is the gun that the British used in World War I and World War II and Korea. So, really, really good design. There's, I, I want to point out Sharps there because Hugo Borchardt was working for Sharps, right? 
Um, but this, you don't find any modern military firearm today that does not use one of these. I don't care if it's an M16 or an AK-47 or a Glock or whatever. It uses a detachable box magazine. And that is James Paris Lee, and the United States Navy was the first to adopt that. So there's another couple of guns that were real cool, but I don't want to get into it because too many rabbit holes. But Jonathan Browning, the guy who had the harmonica gun, his son John Browning, pretty much a mechanical genius. And he was working with Winchester, and they said, we want you to make a shotgun, a repeating shotgun. He said, hey, I got an idea for a pump. And they said, no, we want a lever. OK. So we modified that Spencer and came up with the 1887 tube-fed magazine uh, lever action shotgun. 12 gauge, also came in tin. You know, you do. Oh, sorry, wrong address. Yeah. <laughs> but they're kind of weird in that you have to load it open. You have to put the cartridges in while it's like that. But what the heck? Um, these are, yeah, door greeters. Uh, oh, yeah, speaking of door greeters, there's the guy on the motorcycle um, who had it specially designed to, you know, play rifleman with. Uh, you may recognize him. And finally, for this set of stuff, um, the 1880s, Colt had experimented with double action revolvers, but most of them were still like their, their single action in that in order to operate it, you had to put it half cock, you had to open up a gate, and you had to knock your cartridges out one by one. Okay, They had an 1877 and an 1878, and anyway, it was just awkward. They put a, some mechanic, mechanical engineers to work, and they came out with the new idea, which is swing out cylinder. <coughs> that break open of Smith & Wesson's design was great, but delicate. You could, I mean, when you whack somebody on the head, it could bend it or whatever. Or when the horse rolled over on you, it could bend it. This ain't bending for, well, actually my mom's, my mom's uncle was a uh, New York City policeman, motorcycle policeman. He had one of these, and he actually bent the barrel in an accident. Anyway, um, but they're still real strong. So in 1889, the U.S. Navy, the U.S. Navy is at the head of all this stuff. They adopt a double action swing out cylinder Colt revolver. And you can go to a store today and buy a 38 caliber swing out cylinder Colt revolver. We're still making them. Smith & Wesson's making their version. Ruger, I mean, you name it. It's still the most popular type of revolver today. Um, the US Army adopted it in 1892, and that's what we carried generally in the Spanish-American War. Um, it was decided to be a little weak for dealing, dealing with Filipinos when we took the Philippines and they thought we were giving them their independence like Cuba, but we weren't. And so they objected. And so when we had to shoot them because they were objecting, some of them didn't take that kindly and still cut the heads off of the guys who were shooting them. So they went back to issuing the big old Colt revolver, the big 45s. And anyway, I'll get into that in a minute. OK. 1886, France, remember, France, leader of the military technology introduces a new chemical compound they call smokeless powder. <clears throat> Since 12 something or another, gunpowder had been made approximately the same. It had been made out of a combination of charcoal, sulfur, and saltpeter, which makes voluminous amounts of smoke when you set it off. Which means, oh, he's shooting from over there. <laughs> The French came up with this basically, you know, sulfuric acid and some kind of cotton and um, nitrocellulose. Nitrocellulose, that was it. Good man. Anyway, nitrocellulose powder, basically really refined versions and smokeless powder. They issued their first rifle, that uh, the Labelle in 1886, and that started an absolute arms race. The the French. Actually, their rifle was a tube magazine in the front, like a Winchester. Um, but things heated up fast. Mauser came out with a box magazine rifle, internal. You had to load it from the top. But Winchester got into it 
1895. And again, John Browning, you'll hear this name again, came up with his version. It's not a tube fed because it was noted that most modern smokeless ammunition had a fairly pointy bullet. And if you didn't have the things loaded properly and you had one of those points against your cartridge, you know, your uh, primer, bad things happen, like ba -da So, you had a non-detachable box magazine you loaded from the top. And uh, these were popular. The Russians, <laughs> again, the Russians, bought thousands of these in World War I. Uh, and Teddy Roosevelt was quite taken with that. In fact, he called it big medicine for lions <laughs> when he went on his African safari in, 18, in 1909. This is, this is Kermit Roosevelt shooting a leopard. But um, this was you know, a very popular hunting rifle uh, in the United States for many, many years. Most of them were in 3040 caliber, which was the standard US rifle. This is not six. Smokeless so. powder is also <coughs> powerful. Than powder, isn't it? Yes, smokeless. That's another thing. Smokeless powder is very, um, is much more powerful for the volume. And so a lot of guys blew up a lot of rifles and pistols trying to reload with this new fangled stuff. It's like, oh well, use the same amount, right? <laughs> no. Whoops. Bad idea. Back to Hugo Borchardt. He came up with the first semi-successful. Uh, Auto loading pistol. He used it was a 30 caliber. He used a bottle neck cartridge. The Russians ended up adopting, and they used until the 1950s. But this little gun. Notice what he's got there. It's got a detachable box magazine. Belize used them, and Borchardt used them. And that's it. Borchardt obviously got it from when he worked for Sharps. So now you're using auto loading pistols with a detachable magazine. But not everybody got the clue. Mauser came up with their version in 1896. Same cartridge, more powerful, but box magazine, but internal. Doesn't take, come apart. Uh, I love that character there. Go back in the this cowboy in the middle, I mean, that guy is a character, but he's carrying one of these. The other fellow, he may not have two legs, but he's got himself a carbine Mauser, detachable carbine. And then we've got these guys in the Sherlock Holmes movie. Okay, pet peeve, I got it in a minute. Um, in that movie, they do this really stupid thing. You ready? I'm ready. Okay. If you take apart, let's see, do I have some pin? You don't have time. Okay, anyway, if you take that apart, the whole spring comes out and everything. You don't um, load it from the bottom. Yeah, you gotta load it from the top. You don't do that. It doesn't do anything other than look cool. Do that with your M6. Um, yeah, I see there, it, it had a little thing called a stripper clip and that's how you load it from the top. Uh, but they, they've been gone into the future. I mean, they've been very, very popular. <laughs> um, you just have to modify it a little bit. That's not the future. That's a long time ago. Oh, yeah. They were used a long time ago. Back in the 70s. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> John Browning again. Hero. Uh, he finally convinced Winchester in 1892. Let me design a pump. OK. So they came out with a pump action shotgun in 1892 for black powder. Once smokeless powder came out, they were blowing them up. And so uh, they said, let me design this a little stronger, which he did. And in 1897, they came up with this. This has been well loved for a lot of years. But again, go to a gun store. You can get one almost identical to this. The only difference is that hammer, which has sort of gone by the wayside. But these are nice and loud. Again, good door greeters. Um, but they made these until 1957. So they made them for 60 years. Uh, the U.S. Army adopted them for first off for campaigns in the Philippines. They said the only thing that's really going to stop a charging Moro tribesman is buckshot out of a Winchester pump gun, and um, yeah. And then in the trenches, the Germans said, "Hey, you're carrying an illegal weapon. We're going to execute any American soldiers found with those." And General Pershing replied, saying, "You do that, I'm just going to start executing all your guys we capture." <laughs> The US Army got into the smokeless deal in the 1890s with a Krag, which had a side-loading magazine, which was kind of, the whole thing was a little bit weak. 
However, in 18, 1903, they came up with their version of a Mauser, the 1903. And then introduced the 30 out 6 cartridge. Um, then you got to load it from the top. But very powerful, very accurate. And if you want to shoot it a couple thousand yards, there you go. Um, my eyes won't do it, but it's been done. Um, we used this up and through World War II. They adopted the semi-auto Garand, but they never had enough of them, so they still issued a lot of um, Springfield. And um, in fact, some regiments carried them in preference to the semi-autos because they said, we want to hit our targets. Um, not really that much less accurate than the Garand, but anyway. Um, as you see here, there's, this, is, <laughs> this is one of our two invasions during the uh, Wilson administration of Mexico. A uh, fellow on the left, or on the far right. His right. His right, my right, your left, has a Springfield. This guy's got a Spencer pump shotgun. I don't know where he got that, but that was the first pump shotgun. Uh, God knows where he got it. And then we've got another fellow carrying a 1911-45, a petty officer. Which leads us to this. The US Army got interested in auto-loading pistols pretty early. And who did they go to? John Browning. He came up with one in the 1890s, late 90s, but then 1900 Colt issued their 38 caliber auto Colt pistol, ACP, uh, military. Um, the Army in 1905 did a test. It boiled down to the Colt and Luger, who happened to have apprenticed with Hugo Borchardt. And that's basically a modified Borchardt taking the box magazine. Uh, of course, in 1911, we adopt the 1911 45 caliber pistol in 45, so A, you could shoot charging moros, and B, so you can shoot your horse if you have to. Seriously, that was one of the reasons. These were, they have multiple safeties so that you don't accidentally shoot your horse, but it's powerful enough so that, like if an artilleryman, because artillery is still pulled by horses, you could shoot the horse if he's wounded and he's thrashing, Take him out. And next one. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> I like that one because my grandfather took that picture. Mexico, 19, uh, 1916. Anyway, a couple of <laughs> Joe's or Jewish balls. And then now we get to the modern stuff. 1907, the uh, self loading rifle by Winchester. Basically shoots a 357 Magnum cartridge. Not interchangeable, but to all intents and that is how you load it. And detachable box magazine. Uh, France bought a bunch of these in World War I, used them in the trenches. We thought it was a great idea. And in 1940, we started working on a new and improved version. And it ended up being called the M1 carbine. So there's a lot of interesting developments from all of this stuff. And there's a couple of cowboys, and I think I'm done.